Hey, this is David Rovix uh, with another episode of Fifth Estate Live, which is coming to you as usual every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. in G GMT. And um, it goes out on various platforms, including the Facebook page of Popular Resistance and KBU Community Radio and on YouTube and Twitter and elsewhere and turns into an archived uh, video and audio thing that you can consume at fifthestate.org or look for in podcast form if you look up This Week with David Rovix, wherever you get your podcasts. And um, this week, I'm very happy to be spending the hour with Dave Marsh, longtime music journalist, uh, journalist otherwise, and author of many, many books, and um, founder of Cream Magazine, and a contributor to the Fifth Estate going back to 1969 and a longtime friend of uh, many involved with this project. And there is a uh, ongoing sort of um, uh, event involving panels and uh, discussions and talks and other things um, every weekend for the next three weekends um, about uh, Dave's uh, work and vision, in fact. And it is uh, all you can sign up uh, to in that online uh, series of events at landofhopeanddreams.co. And you can also, this is uh, Fifth Estate Live, you can subscribe to the Fifth Estate at fifthestate.org. And uh, if you do that in the near future, you'll, you'll get a, uh, a copy of Peter Werby's latest novel, new debut novel, which is a fantastic book about uh, Detroit in 1967. So with no further ado, Dave, great to have you on the show. It's great to be on the show. You know, you're saying something about Peter. Peter was such an amazing person for young people. I don't know how many others besides myself, but, you know, I'd say to him, well, can I write about this? Can I write about that? Trying not to be over ambitious or anything, but still ambitious. And so there was this thing going on in Ann Arbor that looked Which like- he wrote about in 69, in the summer yeah, of 69, and, and right? See, and a wonderful right. article. But, the whole, there is no article except that I look at Peter, who I've maybe written a couple of column long stories for, and say, I want to go down there and see what's going on down there. Because I knew the cops were out and all that. And Peter just said, okay, yeah, you, if you can get down there, go ahead and do that. I don't have anybody doing it. You know, and he had that kind of faith in people that he came to respect for what I think, think with me, it was just, I was like the little hippie who could or something. <laughs> um, but, but you know, his, his door was open and he paid me what is still to this day, the compliment that I measure myself against. I've never, I don't think I've ever told Peter this, which is he said to me when I got back, I wrote a story it wasn't a great story. It was pretty good. He said, you know, the good thing about you is you're not a voyeur. <laughs> he said, you know, you go in there and try to get the story. What What's the story? And not just from one angle. And that's been so inspirational to me for 50, however many years, because it is. And I was going to tie that in with Van Morrison. Because my, you, you were talking about your interviews. My interviews tend to be uh, structured uh, by some force other than myself. Not, I mean, but they're not sloppy. It's just I kind of go where the wind takes me. Mm. And the, the, I had never interviewed Van Morrison <laughs> until about a year ago, <laughs> and he's one of my, you know, prime people, and. Uh, so as I'm leaving this interview, which has wandered all over the place to Van's father's record collection, to all this seemingly tangential stuff, and Van says to whoever's his handler that day, you know, that was an interesting interview. It was kind of like a jazz interview. <laughs> and I just thought, yeah. you know, I, 
if you're going to be a Van Morrison fan, there is no pinnacle higher than that. That's a great compliment. <laughs> and I guess it was kind of what I was going for with a lot of my interviews. But then people said, well, that's more like just jagged than, than jazz. You know, I think, but you don't, you don't go for an arc when you do interviews. I, I mean, as an interviewer, you don't, you're not kind of thinking what's going to be the arc of this interview. No, I'm trying to think of the first thing I'm trying to think of is what has everybody else already talked about? Which right. day? And uh, since I do so much rock stuff and so much classic rock stuff or whatever you call it now, you don't call it classic now, mm -hmm. but, you know, you, you're, you're in there, you're in there and you're trying to do something that's not so much original, but, but gives people a newer perspective on things. And that is something that I attribute to learning at the Fifth Estate, that Peter was not looking for what everybody else had done. Yeah. And he was rewarding to work for because he'd tell you what you did wrong, he'd tell you what you, you did right, and he'd encourage you to do what he liked more often. You can't get an editor any better than that. You know, to somebody that really kind of turns you loose within some kind of narrower spectrum and lets you learn on your feet. I, mean, yeah. I, I say something to Peter about it, about the whole thing that he did for me. He's not very good about acting, you know, because it's just what Peter's like. He's not, he doesn't act to ask you a lot of follow ups. <laughs> on that stuff but you know i sort of carry him in my back pocket all the time i hear that yeah when you wrote that article in 1969 uh mm -hmm. from ann arbor michigan describing uh what was uh what basically sounded like an, a police riot uh an ongoing oh, multiple yeah. day <laughs> and uh and and it really w w wasn't going well it seems for for um for folks uh trying to hold the the good guys. <laughs> for the good guys yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it felt like in the article you're talking about i mean it, it kind of seemed, seemed like you know one of the things you mentioned was how if 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 there were more organizing going on and more popular support for this uh, this movement, then things could go a little better, and and it just it just seemed like you're kind of laying the ground for a lot of a lot of future work that you'd be doing possibly. No, look, it was I think by then John Sinclair was already in prison, who had a huge influence on me. Um, can you can you just set the stage a little bit here? I know I know I mean I know this is stuff that other people have already heard. Yeah, yeah what so was going on, what was going on in Detroit at that point where there were these sort of you know, because Detroit is the working class town. So there were all these small but important uh, things going on. And some of them were uh, about, say, labor. That'd be Frank, Frank Joyce, <laughs> you know, your first candidate who was, he's my big brother. And, you know, there'd be, there'd be the, uh, marijuana LSD corridor, <laughs> which is like John Landau and uh, John Landau, which is, which is, uh, Sinclair. Yeah. John Sinclair and, you know, whatever he'd taken up and then, you know, and then the whole anxiety over John being sent to jail theoretically for 10 years, um, that gave you something different to ponder. Um, and you know, but you know, and then there are things like Frank would know more about this, but I knew it just from the point of view of my father was a railroad worker. And so I knew something about trade unions mm -hmm. and it brought it into a different kind of focus than anything else was doing. And that was, and that staring came out of that group of people that Peter had along with himself at the top of that. Uh, I don't know, whatever you would say, uh, at the top of the ladder of the you know, but left wing uh, activist kind of journalism doesn't have, you know, that kind of structure, mm. but it's there anyway. 
because it has to be to get the points out and get them repeated in such a fashion that people will understand them and connect them and move on on their own. Mm. That was the goal. And Peter was extraordinarily, in my reckoning, Peter was extraordinarily good at that. Um, and, I, and I always thought, you know, I'd read other newspapers from other places and I'd often come away just feeling like, yeah, I think they mostly got the story, but do they really have it? And then they're giving it to people in a way, not just like, you know, that whole stupid ass journalism cliche, tell them, tell them what they know, tell them again. You know, it wasn't like that. It was like, tell them, move it along. Tell them, go back if you have to, move it along. And that group of people that I named, and of course there were any number of other people, um, they taught me as much by example you know, and these guys, it's Detroit. The cops aren't nice. So if you've got a dope dealer or something that you're kind of trying to not exact change to, to, to champion, you know, there, there's a possibility you're going to get your head kicked in. And that, that you know, and that could have happened in Chicago couldn't have happened in most of the real big center of the country or, or I don't mean center of the country. There's any of the real big coastal because that was everything was such a big news item that happened mm. in both places. But this was just like sitting there and it was journalism that was left on the ground that if one or another of us didn't do it, it didn't get done. Mm. The, the thing, some of these things were really important. They were important to the anti-war movement. They, they were important to the civil rights movement. They were important to uh, what was being transformed into uh, the music movement. And and with a actually an amazing number of uh, different kinds of people with different kinds of perspective about it that prevented it from becoming a dull roar. That's why cool. the term "move" the movement was so popular, wasn't it? I mean, because it was really yeah, broad, whole, ecumenical. You know, and 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 that was what, if you were a kid like me, at least, that was what you were hungry for. You wanted to be in on the action in a in an intelligent way. And. I mean, that you were talking about how that you didn't get as much press in the Midwest as you would on the coasts, but of course, the arrest of John Sinclair ended up being something that John Lennon wrote a song about, which which got the whole situation. Yeah, out. now name the second song. That was the second song. No, was that? I'm saying now name the second song. <laughs> there is no second song. No, no, <laughs> that was the song, right? It was a, It wasn't. It wasn't a very and, good song. It was like you wrote if it. You were, <laughs> if you were an 18 year old kid, and you have and and. You know, you're in that, and you know John from street corners and protest events and concerts. And st or, John Sinclair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and uh, what we, I think what, what we in Detroit had ultimately was a lot more follow through and a lot more ambition in the sense of let's let's get this down so we can move on to the next thing, but also let's get this down because we're going to need to use it. That's how it always felt to me. And so, and it wasn't, you know, a large number of people who shared our perspectives on any given thing, not even the war. It actually, more sad, not even the civil rights movement was kind of a lot like now. Right. You know, the hate was there at the fringes. It was Marpy. You, but you identified at the time, at least in that in that article, I don't mean to, to focus so no, much on okay. this one article, but I like you, that article. 
Yeah, I mean, me too. You, you, you identified yourself as a white panther, as did John Sinclair. And I, and I think a lot of people have never heard of that term or what it means. And they might get an entirely wrong association with what it means. And can you talk oh, about Oh, and they what, did. Uh -huh, <laughs> talk about that. What, 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 what did you well, mean by that? And what was, what, who were the was white panthers? That was because that was a tricky one because the, Black Panthers, of course, were the were the voice, the, the media voice, and otherwise, of the white. What am I saying? The White Panthers were the, were the voice of what was sort of an attempt to create a Caucasian birth version of the. Uh, uh, of you know the the, the uh, movement movement the movement of of you know for black freedom and the movement for as it turned out as it exploded lots and lots of other things and I, it, that all came out of John Sinclair's vision really in terms of the that image of the Black Panther supplementing the or the white panthers supplementing the black panther that was all you know uh a deliberate attempt to create a kind of syndicate or whatever you want to call it you know and you can see some of this actually some of the recent films about chicago movement and uh you know the stuff about uh the uh this, the uh, things that cropped up around around uh, anti-war protests in Chicago and places like that. You can see that there, but I think in Detroit, it might have been more organized. Maybe it's just what little I know about history. But, you know, when I talk to people, they don't have what this group of people who didn't agree with each other all the time, I mean, you know, you get Peter and, and <laughs> you get Peter and Sinclair and Frank Joyce uh, talking about something, and you know they're ricocheting all over the building. That's good for young people. That's the healthiest thing that could have happened in a certain way. It would have been better if we were completely united, but I'm thinking in the realm of the possible here. Mm. <laughs> and, and so, so at least for me, that was my university really was yeah. and and it wasn't a shaggy university you know it was really well populated by serious people and from time to time we had some fun <laughs> seems like more than a little bit of fun <laughs> <laughs> well we did we did and that that was part of the good thing about having marijuana wound into it here here you know what who was it which paper had wasn't Worby, was it? We believe in the cosmic giggle. That wasn't. Somebody had that on their newspaper. I like it. <laughs> I think it was somebody in San Francisco, probably. But um, that so that you didn't have a sense like that there were just these little narrow passageways through. Exotica. It was a sense of this and this and this and this. You know, it's like two plus two equals six. I can't remember who I stole that from either. I like it. <laughs> it, was, it. It was like that. It was, it was, uh, and it was, you know, like Pun thinks this and, you know, Marsh is sitting down there. He's so weird now. He's only listening to rock and roll records half the time. And, you know, but he's still trying to pitch away at it. And, you know, this one and that one and the other one, it was a brotherhood. I don't know if we knew how to, with our activities, uh, sort of spell out a, you know, something like that, this data elaborate. But it was it was all encompassing. 
the, to a certain the, point, and then it fell apart, and that's what happens to movements. Right. I'm sure it does. <laughs> Greek is the first time you're in one, though. Yeah, right. You know, well, because the movement yeah. it achieved high heights and, and low lows when it fell apart, I guess. For well, your world is... Re well, what happens there is your world begins to collapse, which is very threatening. Yeah. And you're very young and very inexperienced and probably not very well read. But then somebody will pop up who's been off dealing bubblegum acid or something, <laughs> you know? Uh, I can't even, there, I, I believe there was no such person actually. But, but there should be, bubblegum acid definitely needs to be invented if it hasn't been. I mean, it wouldn't be hard, right? Just it wouldn't to, be very to good to drop in the bubblegum, but yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be good for your teeth to start no, with. No, no, it should be sugar-free. <laughs> <laughs> Many things were, because uh, you needed that for another uh, psychedelic, but uh, it, it was, uh, it felt, and when I talked to other people who grew up at the same time, or even back then, when I was going around doing stories for whether it was Cream or Rolling Stone or whoever I eventually did them for, from, it was there, but it was splintered. And somehow the Detroit thing was more unified. And maybe that's just, I think that this is part of it for sure. That is the blessing or the legacy of all that labor organizing that was not alien to us. We weren't a bunch of kids who just came off the campuses. They're kids who came out of families where, where dad was building cars and, you know, Uncle Tom was, was uh, you know, working on the electric uh, union and or or just working on electricity um and your dad worked on the railroad my dad worked on a the railroad there was plenty of that going around um and it gave us i think a greater sense of solidity in terms of our actions you know and, and it again it was i mean it was my pet rock and roll i think that probably did a lot of damage and caused it to begin to fall a, fall out, you know, fall apart. Hmm. But I don't think that was entirely avoidable because nobody was sophisticated enough to build the right kind of structure and nobody had enough, uh, or hardly anyone had enough education, which, you know, you can't, you want to change the world, you can change the world, no doubt about it. But if you want to change, change the world in a way that really matters, then you've got to learn what is that process. And you, and you did some lear learning back then. And, and then other forces are going to try to uh, work against what you're trying to do too and, well, and, and turn well, out all That's exactly the point. But here's the thing, okay? In these smaller units, what you learned was even if they pick a few of us off, we're still going to be there if we want to be there. And if we try to use our resources intelligently. And so they couldn't really kill it off because people, people got excited. And, you know, America boasts about a lot of things. It's really a pretty dull place, <laughs> you know, very conformist and, and, uh, uh, you know, hampered so by so many things, by its sexism, by its racism, by its classism, by you know its parochial uh, uh, perspective, and this stuff began gradually, I think, to infiltrate the thinking not of students but of kids. Mm. That was another free place. I don't mean it was free to get in, get in or get out. I mean it was a place where there was room, there was space. Yeah, well, there was that that thing. I'm trying to think who it was who who, who uh, somebody asked them. Uh, you know, what did it say on <laughs> on you know in the Bible on on the uh, 
you know, on, on the Ten Commandments or whatever it was. And somebody said, well, it said thou mayest. That was John Sinclair. <laughs> that was this whole thing. Thou mayest. Thou mayest. Please and, and, feel free. You know, Some it said on the wall somewhere. I just it, it, it's you know, it was a thing that after everybody else has stopped believing, you can still believe in that. And after a lot of partial failures and bigger failures and bigger and that failures, you could say, "But wait a minute, we did that one thing." you know, up there in Ann Arbor or over there in Flint, which is a town in Michigan for those of you who aren't from there. Uh, the great water. <laughs> well, it had great water. Then. I'm not so sure what it is now. <laughs> Toxic um, sludge. But anyway, it was like, you know, and, and but that is another thing about about the Michigan point of view, which is that you know, I had a grandmother who was from, uh, I don't know, she was from, from, you know, way upstate. And she was, I think she was probably some kind or another of uh, Native American. And, you know, and then there were people who later went on to give us many of the most rueful things in that, in history of that region. But, you know, like my, the, some some of them were putting together the apparatus that eventually did all that bombing and stuff uh, against everything that was good about the rebellions we've seen in the last twenty years. And I, you know, I think I don't think I'm that singular in that. A lot of different pieces of that floated through my family and through my head. And it didn't do what you would think it would do, which is confuse the whole thing. It actually gave more sense that you could try something because all you could do was lose. Hmm. But you have to teach somebody in a way that it's okay to lose on those issues because you're building something. And that consciousness was always in in the meetings that you would go to, in the you know it wasn't it wasn't sectarian to that degree, and that was a great liberator. It always is. You know, I'm not saying that people got actually free, because I don't even know where actually free is. Hmm. I don't think there's a is there a town in New York in. Uh, <laughs> that's right free is a town in new york <laughs> is there a town? i was gonna say is there a town in michigan that's called free and, and maybe there is that's but, where it is you know it was off it's possibility they've possibility and i think a lot of people you know if you had like when when i did my book about woody guthrie um with a lot of people who had been there from the early, uh, you know, from, from the early movement of mostly socialists and so forth, mm -hmm. they all had kind of the same vision of what could be accomplished. Well, that seems irreplaceable. But my version of that is, yeah, and then all the kids got together and tried to figure it out. And that's just as true. You did not having Karl Marx at your at your bedside would not hurt you. It would help you in a great many ways, but it wasn't essential to get anything done. What was essential to get anything done was hope and ambition and uh, in the end. I think it's uh, the way everybody who was involved in that, even in the peripheral way I was, I think it was about love. I don't care if I sound like a hippie. <laughs> I was one for right. a while. 
<laughs> but but really, it was that human contact. Mm -hmm. And that was really, when you thought about it, whether you were talking about the civil rights movement or, uh, you know, Vietnam, any of those things, they had to find a source of their love in order to keep those movements effective. Yeah. And even a little kid, which is all I was, you couldn't miss it. Mm -hmm. And it was the best part of everything. Doesn't And it didn't mean that you could become a slacker. It meant you had to work extra hard because you came to understand that this stuff could be wiped out in a minute. And, and you came to understand the, the, the courage that people had. You know, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, whatever you're talking about. You know, I was going to name some names, but that gets sectarian real fast. Sure. <laughs> Dave, you... you um... You know, I mean, I think so much of what you're talking about also, I'm, I'm just, as you're talking about these things, I'm constantly thinking about how they also, everything you're talking about can relate to the power of music to it be a force for change and and popular education and, and to be, to foster that sense of community and, and love. And I mean, and I'm wondering about I mean, there's, I have a hell of a lot of questions that we're not going to get to. I know that. But but when you started Cream Magazine, wh what was the state of the music industry generally? I didn't really start Cream thinking... Magazine very crazy. You... It was a bunch of other... You weren't right on the ground <laughs> floor. You were early on, but not on the ground yeah, floor. Yeah, I was like, you know, two, two issues or something. Okay. Well, when you got into it, what which was quite early on, what was... That was the what, what were you motivated largely by the by the potential of music as a tool for social change or or were you looking at the disaster of the music industry at the time or sorry was that I want to get my friends out of jail oh that's good <laughs> that's you know whether, whether we were talking about Pon Pon Plumundin or or Sinclair or whoever and I wanted and I wanted people to understand that this was not a goof this was serious great and that it was that it and that it had casualties like anything else like that but it also could make a measurable feelable difference to people who were otherwise in a huge jam and and if you're 16 or 17 you can't carry it beyond that I won't pretend that I did at that time, but, you know, and just to be the complete hippie here, let me mention to you that like it says in the Bible, the greatest of these is love. Yeah. That's, that's the fight. How do you, because you're not going to love a lot of people you run into and a lot of them are going to try to unlove you to the point of the graveyard. Mm. It's all true. Yep. You had to worry about your friends, but you also, you had to make friends and that was a healthy product. It wasn't isolated. It wasn't people putting on a show. I mean, we were, but at the but same time, community. the show we were putting on, well, I don't know. It was a scrappy little community, <laughs> you know. But I mean, like in the sense, of, quite the, the sense of the performer audience dynamic, it was more of a of a of, no, a, the dynamic, of a movement. Yeah, the dynamic was: how are we going to survive this? It really was, and so so the fact that it was a harder place to do these things could itself be inspiration. And it inspired a lot of people. And you do hear from time to time people talking about, wow, well, the Detroit movement. And then they don't quite know what to do with it because they didn't have the follow through. And, you know, 
the reason why was the follow through there? What did follow anyone through, have the follow through? through? Was there because what, what do they mean by that? I mean, in the sense, hated everything we did. <laughs> but what was? I mean, I don't know if anyone had follow through, right? In the sense that they mean it, but where they mean the term. But but what was that? Were I mean, it seems like in terms of like music and social movement, a lot of stuff. There was very particular. People, I mean, had, there was, there was, people had flavors. I mean, that's just your diet. This different it had a, Detroit had a particular flavor, but I'd say Detroit and and San Francisco both had a, a particularly powerful, disproportionately powerful impact on the on the sort of on working class culture in in this country and, but, uh, and on the, at that time in particular. Well, I don't think that the nature of class in San Francisco, having worked there around that time, and Detroit were very much alike at all. No, but both very influential on. on because, the, because, the well, I was going to scene. say about San Francisco was classist. You know, it was about being hip. You could take somebody like me. You know, I wouldn't have known hip if it bit me in the leg. You know, I wouldn't know know it if it bit me in the leg and the ass at the same time. I didn't know anything about being hip. I had like ninety-seven cents in my pocket. And hip is expensive. That was where Barry Kramer was useful sometimes because he was a businessman. Um, and you would get that perspective. Uh, you know, so, so I think that it's that all the things that are open and all the things that can't be knocked down easily and all the things that people come to believe in that may or may not have ever had had a had a relationship to reality. Um, when you analyze stuff in retrospect, you mean like like the stuff the stuff that you, when you when you're looking back on on history and and things that happen and and trying to when when you like put put new meaning on things that you weren't thinking about at the time is it, when you're trying to. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, past. I don't think there's any. You know, this is where the advantage of being hippies or hippie-ish kicks in because you're not rigidly locked to a given ideology and you're not, you know, there's, you don't have ways to do things. You're in, you have to invent your ways of doing things. You don't have any money. You have to, you know, how are you going to feed people? Um you know, you don't have any transportation. How are you going to move them? And I think that's something that um, the uh, the axes of that were probably more like uh, you know, Chicago gets very close in there, important in there. Detroit stays important. L.A. in certain, I mean, not L.A., New York in certain ways and not in certain ways because everybody, you know, and everything. But but the big thing was those things were competitive because everybody had a different vision, which is good. Hmm. But also everybody had a set of limits. That's the value of a police force. <laughs> and so everybody had to figure out what's the way I can get out of here alive and what's the way I can get into here and inspire some more life. It's that whole thing. And uh, that was, to me, that was the teaching. You know, there were lots and lots of other things to learn, and different people learn them in different ways. And some people read Marx and Engels and were better off for it, and some people read John Sinclair and were better off for it, and some people just listened to the MC5 and were better off for it. Or, for that matter, you know, you'd be amazed by how much jazz got listened to in those little hippie dens. 
Mm. Because you had a guy in Sinclair who loved that music and who carried it forward with him like a banner and had really good in taste in it. And not just John, but John was sort of the lead, you know, the crucial force. You could, but you could have all these things, and you didn't have to sit around so much as we do now and say, "Well, how do we do this?" Well, we do it all these ways. I don't know. I don't know how we did it. We just did it. And I'm not arguing for a kind of like baseless nihilism or even a baseless anarchism. I'm just saying. You got to work with each other to give each other courage and insight. And then you can not only change the world, but you can change it big time. And I've seen it done. Dave, in doing journalism, whether you're talking about print or, or radio and all kinds of other mediums, I, I was, I'm just wondering, like in, in the age of underground print newspapers and, and, and all kinds of stuff that was going on, you know that that has happened in the past and is a lot less common now like if i mean this is a really geeky question perhaps i don't know but well, when, when, i'm a geek when, okay good <laughs> when reagan deregulated uh radio in 1981 as soon as he came to power and thousands of radio journalists basically overnight lost their jobs and local radio to, uh, can, you know canceled their uh, news departments pretty much immediately. You know, I mean, there was like it was seismic. Yeah, that was the big money. That was the big money. Uh, um, I wasn't working in radio yet, but that was working in it yet. When it when it first, I wasn't working in radio then. Right. But but you were involved in the in the, in the industry and I was involved in it, and I studied it some. And I will tell you that the po politicalness of of radio as a medium did not die in that thing. It was on a commercial bent, yes, it was shrunken because they didn't have to do what they had to do before. You know, but they didn't have to have a news department, for example. Yeah. Um, or they didn't have to, you know, whatever they didn't have to. But the whole sneaking truth of, of that all those movements that we've been talking about is that sometimes you're better without off without permission. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're better off with a vision as screwy as it may be that carries you to the next step or even to imagining the next step. That those are all valid things to happen. And a lot of them can't be controlled because they're so spontaneous. And I know that's that, irks a lot of particularly Marxist, but it's true. I'm not saying it's the base, best route to go because you're going to have a lot of, I mean, you have a lot of, lot more casualties, but you're going to have a lot of people who don't get the full picture. But the full picture at that time was so big, nobody got it all that I know of. Yeah. And I know this is related and maybe I'm totally skipping ahead to <laughs> very much, but the past 20 years then saw this other like change in the industry and in journalism and in, in music and the arts in so many ways that were, in, in, I'd say in so much. You're talking about in the last 20 years, money. Yeah, money. the last 20, like the internet. I mean, that was no, like so what much trying, What you're trying to talk to me about is that money became more central. Well, more, I would say the 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 music the the, the music industry uh, shrank by eighty percent to the the big three labels, uh, you know, and and money became uh, concentrated in the big in big tech, right? They're making lots of money, but the the industry between what nineteen ninety seven and twenty seventeen, right. I think, uh, like right. record sales went down to twenty percent of what they were, and and now it's mostly streaming in terms of sales, like in terms of you know, Cheers. right. Yeah, I mean, I'm a hippie. Has... I don't want anybody to sell a lot of records. I want them to steal. Good, good. Talk, would you talk about that? I mean, what's, what's and, and, and from the point of view of the way people thought about record sales, then everything you do on the internet now is theft. 
and they had to redefine sales and theft. And that has happened and nobody noticed it. This is not my first, con I mean, I did notice it. This is not my first conversation about this phenomenon. What, what do you mean by nobody noticed? How anybody tweeted and, and partly people think they kind of jackets and, and one of the jackets is that things have to have a clearly defined beginning. No. Sometimes, you know, sometimes somebody drops the atom bomb and it inspires the peace movement. Sometimes people are just trying to get a hamburger and it inspires a big piece of the freedom movement. It's, and that's the problem with, you know, I mean, at some level you can't control it and succeed. At some level you've got to turn it loose. At some level you've got to say, let a man come in and do the popcorn, you know, <laughs> and, and all that got done. And that's why it was so much more productive now. Were all the productions good? Of course not. Because they were all built in this disposable, maliciously uh, greedy, uh, you know, segments inside of capitalism, which does not value human life very much. But Fortunately, we can't control everything because if, if we could, we'd immediately narrow, I think, our, not so much our ambitions, but just, you know, our capacity to recognize change for what it is when it occurs. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take my grandson to a movie about how uh, rock and roll changed the world exactly. I want to take him to a movie that tells him that the world is changeable and not accidentally and not haphazardly. That's a good message. And that's a message where really no decent person has to lose. But you got also to get rid of the idea that you can do it without work. No, you can't. I mean, that's just a flat no. You can't do it without work. You don't want to work. There's only two possibilities. One of which is that the work doesn't get done. And the other of which is that you're full of shit and you did the work anyway. You just don't know it was work, which is not a bad way to go. <laughs> that was sort of how I wound up being a rock and roll writer. You know, it's like, hey, this is neat. I get to, I get, you know, to to have pieces of paper where, not with my name on it, that was in there, but not so big, except when it came down to want to eat and sleep. But it was mostly, you know, hey, this is this is a way, you know, that people can communicate and that people can change things what, what, if you know, it changes what, them in there then it's dead what was your as a, I'm, you know, i've been a professional musician for the past 25 years and i um always tell people you know it doesn't matter what you the had a raise think. Yet? sorry <laughs> have you had a raise yet yeah right. <laughs> no, my rent doubled and my wages were cut in half by Spotify. But well, yeah, you know, uh, you could have you could have been in the auto industry in 1965 and had the same experience. It could have been way worse. <laughs> totally. I'm I'm very happy this in the industry, really. But you know, 
But I always tell people what really matters is what your audiences think of what you're doing. And that's really, you know, that what other people think of your music is really not particularly relevant. But I'm as somebody who spent much of your time actually as a music critic, what do you think of what, what was your role as a, as a music critic? And what, what is that? Criticize what me. is that role? <laughs> to describe music and just criticize it and try to fit it into into meaning because music is as great as we've ever said it is right but until somebody shows us how to use that music so what but some guy comes along whether it's john sinclair or or john lennon or uh you know johnny the boy down the street or women for the first time in you know popular music history women were in charge for a while they still are actually i think that's the most underreported part of music in the 19 in the 21st century is that women are in charge women are in charge in, in what sense there's a really interesting in the sense bbc that series on this. everybody else's ass <laughs> say, say it again. I said it in the sense that Beyonce can kick everybody's ass. That could yeah. not have happened because it could not have been a woman. They wouldn't have accepted you, me, them, whoever would not have accepted a woman leading. And now, who do I try to listen to? I try to make sure I don't miss Beyonce. And if I go back a little further, well, you know, Donna Summer couldn't have done that without Donna. And, you know, and it's, and it's part of it is also that we get so hung up in having to articulate everything in words that we don't, that we kind of elbow certain realities out of the scene. And that isn't really very good for anybody. But I like, you know, I mean, Michael Jackson, if he hadn't turned out to be a perv, <laughs> you know, he, he was 12 years old and he changed the goddamn world. That hasn't happened since Jesus Christ. Hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's just history. And that, I don't know about Jesus' part, but that really happened. I was there for it. I didn't think that was going to happen. It was a it, seismic no, impact on the music industry that he had in terms of opening no, up in so many ways. Impact or? on the world. On the world. Yeah. That stuff is transcendent in a way that merely selling records or even merely, merely playing records or even merely singing songs isn't. Not until you build it into something bigger. And there are, you know, I mean there there are myriad examples in every part of culture where this happens to somebody and they write about it everybody thinks isn't that odd i wish we could do that now instead of going out and doing it <laughs> it's i don't want to sound like i think that these things would just grow if you kind of kick enough dirt over them mm. but it's a place to start dave when you think about the role that music can play that when it when it's really working and and doing something magical is are there any particular moments that in in history that come to mind where where music and 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 a social movement was really fused in in a way that that was really pushing things forward i don't think music does that or it does it all the time and people don't notice one or the other but that those things when what you were just talking about that is, you know, that's a social process. And music does not live in a society by itself without humans. So I don't, I don't exactly know the answer to your question, but I know what I, what I think and what I, after years and years of reading as well as writing about it and listening to it, 
and you know trying to figure out how to play it forget that with me um it's and the other thing that we don't talk enough about is how beautiful it is because unless it's beautiful you know i mean i don't mean to say that heavy metal isn't beautiful because it is you just got to know how to play it or hear it and and disseminate it i guess and and uh then you can have all these things begin to happen and all those things lead to other things just like any other car wreck <laughs> but it has to be beautiful to start with it's not just about whatever yeah, they might but call content your beautiful isn't going to be my beautiful right not in that climate you know that's that's a lot of it is look what you want to know the single thing single artist that I had a role in launching. You know who that was? Was it okay. Springsteen? Not Springsteen. Nope. No, who's that? Iggy Pop. Ah. Nobody like Iggy had ever existed before. Nobody. And what was so particular, what'd you say? And succeeded. Because he was just unclassifiable. You know, he was he was out of control. He wanted to be out of control. He wasn't afraid of being out of control. And the sneaky part about the son of a bitch is that it was all in control anyway. And by him. You know, because that's just what Iggy's like. And that still inspires me in a way that almost nothing else that I've been deeply involved with does. I mean it doesn't inspire me. Uh, Bobby Blueland does, but it it, inspire, it inspires me in a different way and for a different reason, and it's just about as important because it sets me free, and it sets the people I love free, and it that can't remove us from danger, but it doesn't have to give us a way out; it has to have to give us a, a way back in. And that it does sometimes, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how much with people like Iggy, as if there were any really like him, but you know, that, that people don't get this. And most, uh, most people don't get it. Most people think it's a freak show, which it might be on a given night or even on a given year or you know, broader plateaus than that even but that brings you back to the other thing which is well what did you do with it you know what did you do with it what did you do with it that did the harm you wanted to do what did you do with it that did the the boogaloo the way you wanted it to, the, you know, is all those questions continually pop up and they're never completely resolved. And they're not irrelevant when they're born and they're not irrelevant when people lose sight of them. They just are. Just endless part of life process there. Well, that's man, now, I, now I'm back to being a hippie. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> um, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying when you unleash something that seems simple, it isn't simple if it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. And when you make something that looks really complicated, it don't mean shit unless <laughs> unless you can get back to that to that you know, simpler thing. It's all, it's, it's a, it's not, you know, you look at the charts and in, in music books and stuff, and it's like, it shows everything on a kind of set of, of uh, vertical and horizontal lines, right? It's 
all happening in a circle. It's all happening in a dozen different vectors and a duff, buzz, du, bah, and dozens of different matches catching fire and burning things down. And somebody else picking up a pail of water and saying, oh, let's not finish that one. Let's not finish burning that one. You know, and, and it, it, that probably sounds crazy, but I've seen it all happen. You know, and it can happen in music easier than anywhere else because music is the cheapest thing to reproduce. You can do it with just your thumbs. You can do it with just your lips. So why don't you? Yeah. And that's where being able to carry a tune screws everything up. <laughs> <laughs> presuming, yeah, that. Uh, uh, <laughs> presuming that uh, you want to carry a tune. I've been places yeah. where nobody did, and they weren't all bad. You don't want to hear about the percentages, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, and then, they, then you get back to that essential. That's a good way to get back to that essential question of form. Can you hold on to the beautifulness while you do something as ugly as Ted Nugent? You know, I, I've convinced myself at least, no, you can't, but you can come damned close. Which is both frightening and inspiring. Hmm. I mean, that's interesting when you mentioned Ted Nugent's beauty, because, I mean, I always say that music has these, can play very different roles in different situations. Of course, you know, you can... Marshall I wasn't music. really trying to say that Ted was beautiful. You know, <laughs> I don't think very many adult men who run off, you know, with with sixteen year old girls are. But you know, he brought a certain way that he attacked the guitar and things like that. That that. Uh, Maybe they maybe a way to think about it is they needed invention, so somebody went and invited them. I mean, invented them. Or maybe they needed invention, so somebody uh, <laughs> you know went ahead and and invited them. I don't, it could be either way. It's you know, and this is all under one headline, which I love, which is. And which is a classic way of thinking about popular culture. Was that fun? It was, I think it was Ted Allen or one of those, those uh, vaudeville comedians had a routine where uh, he had a big straw boater hat. And uh, a pair of scissors. And he got, you know, this is a vaudeville day, or right after. And they take it out into the the actual show palace, or whatever they call it. And Ted Allen, if that's who it was, somebody, um, I know where the book is. Um, that I learned this from. And, and it's like Ted, New, Ted Nugent, Ted, what did I say? Ted, uh, Ted, Ted Nugent or Steve Allen? Was it, the, was yeah, it? No, it wasn't Steve Allen. God knows. Not uh, Steve Allen. No. Whoever it was. Ted Allen? Big step, Ted, I'll think of it. Um, pro probably tomorrow, but I'll think of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, and it doesn't matter who it is, it was somebody. And he gets out in front of this audience and it's, you know, like one of those big, 
vaudeville shows, which was probably, I don't know, 200 people or something. And he has a pair of scissors and he has this uh, harmonica, say. And he's got two or three people from the audience that are standing next to him. And he says, you know, do you know what funny is? The guy standing next to him is, is uh, no, I don't know. Next guy, do you know what funny is? No. Next guy, ask him the same question, but before he can answer, somebody reaches over and cuts off the end of the thing that he's been working with, right? And so the guy says, well, is that funny? And after all this setup, everybody in the house is laughing except the guy who is there being had is not laughing. And he says, do you think that's funny? And the guy says, no. And he says, well, they do. They do. They do. That's how it really works. That's, <laughs> that's really spreading culture and changing the world. I know it's, it's idiocy. This is one of the things you can learn from Iggy. Yeah, that's why it's that's why it's important. It's idiocy. Because you wouldn't have done that unless you were jumping around like an idiot. And there's rock and roll right there. You know. You think people didn't laugh at Elvis and his suits that were loud and brazen and too tight? Too, too loose, whatever it is. I think they didn't laugh at him. Of course they laughed at him. Then he turned it over and he laughed at them. Or he made friends out of them. You want to change the world? That's another way to do it. And that's, it goes on like that forever. To me, the chain mm -hmm. human culture goes on like that forever, I guess, because nobody it's, it's never going to be that everybody learns that specific lesson, N nor does it have to be. But you never can stop going to school. <laughs> Excellent thoughts, all of them. <laughs> Well, I've been thinking thinking about this stuff for a long time. And I've been bemused by it many times because people get so hung up in the form and get so hung up in propriety and so hung up in this and that. And really, if you took a four-year-old out there and gave him a harmonica and a stick or something like that though most of those people couldn't learn because they're too busy trying to figure out what the stick is for hmm. or whatever you use it for do something with it well no not necessarily that's just that out. is the most dangerous idea in the world <laughs> <laughs> well, it's usually good for hitting on something. People say, no, no, but what I mean is, is like somebody says, well, we'll do something. Do you know what happens if you just do something? That could be bad. Happens. If you just do something, Martin Luther King dies. If you just go out and do something, some nut shoots John Lennon. No, you can't just do you can't just do something. That's that's that never works ultimately. Intentionality but, helps. I don't know how many before before he killed John Lennon, how many guys do you figure that that uh, gunman took? I think that's the answer to that. 
nobody gets out alive is a lie. Everybody gets out alive is a lie. Somebody's going to get out, and we're going to make sure of it. That's society. <laughs> it just is. And I mean, you know, my thinking runs so heavily to the oddball humorist that people just think I'm goofing around. I'm not goofing around. I don't even know how to goof. I know how to goof well enough. My wife's down the hallway if you want to talk to her. But, <laughs> but I, it's people change each other. And they take chances to do it. And people are terrified of change. And they take chances not to do it. Somebody's got to do each of those things. Because if they don't, you're going to have still water, which may run deep, but it's still stagnant. And, and um, not very healthy. But at the same time, you got to let the river roll. That's true, too. And what you have to do is stop worrying about what's true, because if you can do it and accomplish it, it's true. And if you can do it and you can't stop, it's not true. Because then it's sick. That's but more good advice. If you if you just but if you just, you know. Listen to the guy who sounds smart. Listen to the woman who who shows you what love is. Listen, listen to the baby that cries. Listen to the baby that doesn't cry. And that's, you know, that's where we all fuck things up. You know, it's because you evolve past that point where somebody says, can you, and you don't say that, how do you know you can? And you don't say thou mayest, but that's meaning that's a possibility. You don't say anything and that's dead. You know, my wife Barbara and I and her sister uh, I want to say her sister Paula so my, <laughs> it's my sister Paula no mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you know but our family put it to you that way okay we lost a daughter to cancer she was I think 23 years old it's been a long time mm -hmm. and You know, you should have seen that girl listen to music. She listened to music. Sorry, I'm feeling a little, no, a little lonesome here. Uh, this is a listen to music like it could change the world. Yeah. And I'd be... Uh, perfectly willing to die in order to convince people that that's not a lie. Mm. And that's something I learned from me. <laughs> that's something I learned from Miggy too. You know. That music can change the world. It did. Hell, you, you, you could, if I sat you down and said, I'm going to cut off your right hand, your right hand, are you right-handed? Mm, yeah. I'm not actually going to do it. You don't have to do it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> if I sat you down and I said, if you don't do this, I'm going to cut your finger off. You wouldn't do it. 
But sometime it might come to you that unless you cut the finger off, unless you cut the hand off, unless you harm the surface in order to gain the reality, that's that's more evil and futile than anything else if you just won't do it out of fear out of greed out of whatever the reason is you got it you got to try but people don't want to try because they want to win the, the role of optimism and hope in the trying in the first place sure that analogy i just used is really hopeful <laughs> yeah you know it's more desperate uh and desperate's okay but it doesn't motivate people as much as optimism does it seems to me i don't know that i don't know that for sure god knows people create enough <laughs> people create enough desperation they must get something out of it <laughs> well there's that <laughs> Exactly, you know, but, but, you know, all this stuff's out there to be explored and tell other people about and lie to other people about and love and hate and make a society with. And that is the thing that I'm most proud of about being involved in rock and roll during this era because people tried and they didn't only think they won if they had a had a winner i'm tired of that shit you know and i just think that's that's kind of how it works you 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 got to shoot blind at it sometime. And at the same time, be really careful that you don't hit any of those kids. Because that's a sin. Dave, it's so, been such a I don't a know. Pleasure. I pontificated enough for one day. I think that's I'm a, you a think whole so. lot of good pontificating. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's nice to play a home game, as I always say when I'm in Detroit. Hmm. Um, and it's always nice to converse with smart people so that you guys went on two of those levels. And then I think one of the reasons why I do so many ridiculous things sometimes is to show people it won't kill you. Hmm. You got to be willing to be a fool. That's another big Iggy point. You know, when I sound like I'm trying to make a, a, a an Iggy Bible here, I'd be okay with that. I wouldn't, don't think I would want to sit down and consciously do it because I think there are all kinds of <laughs> dangerous spirits in that. But we got a church of John Coltrane in Louisiana, you know, so there's some precedent. Just don't, just don't get cancer. Yeah, Louisiana is a good place to do that. No, it well, isn't that what John Coltrane got? Maybe it's don't get. I don't know, but there's so much so much cancer in Louisiana with all the oil. There... Cancer Alley, they call it. Yeah, I know. It's it's uh, it's uh, you know. It's just, you got to face it. You sit there. My daughter was dying. Kristen. She said to me, she said, you better hope I don't die. I said, why? <laughs> she said, because mom and Sasha, her sister, said, they love you, but I like you. 
that's probably the greatest thing anybody ever told me. Because that's how you live your life. If you can. You're given time and energy and all that stuff. And then sometimes you have to just walk up, walk up to them and give them the giggles. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that either. That's important. And she knew it was funny when she said that to me. I mean, she was really, I think it might have been the last time I saw her really busted up with laugh, laughter. Mm. And it was just such a cool thing for somebody who was, I guess by then she was 19 or 20, 21 maybe, still be able to say that and get that riff off and hit me with the revelation at the end. is like everybody this is going to make me cry everybody thinks she lost she won hmm. <laughs> and she did i lost her mother lost her sister lost her lover lost she won because she got to the end of her life, however short it was. And she achieved what she could achieve. That's, I mean, if I were talking to a cancer doctor right now, we probably just going to shake our heads. <laughs> and we wouldn't be wrong to. It would still be the truth because the truth is the thing that, like it or not, okay, I've wasted enough of your time. Not at all, Dave. Thank you. Kind of fun though, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. I get to do all the talking. I always think that's all. I got <laughs> <laughs> that's how it's supposed to be in an interview. <laughs> Don't need to say that. that. <laughs> Is that what that, what, did you say? <laughs> what was that thing you were telling me about? Which thing? <laughs> but didn't you tell me that there was like a, some kind of rule or. Oh yeah. The arc, the arc. Yeah. Yeah. That, that yeah, didn't. Yeah. I gave arc. up on the arc a long time ago in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but Noah could be just around the corner. The arc? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go on a ride in that great one. club. It used to be a great club in Ann Arbor called the Ark. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. It's one of the founding places of Michigan rock and roll. Oh, really? I know of it more as like a singer songwriter place, but I, that was like more. Well, I mean, I, that's, I lump all those things together. Right. Good. That's best. They're best lumped well, together. More rock and roll in the end. Yeah. That's right. Good. I was going to ask you about that. Even if, no matter how answer. hard it fight, that's, the, that's the real fun. No matter how hard. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how hard it and the people who are trying to do it <laughs> fight, <laughs> it's still all rock and roll. It's still all rock and roll. Good. So we don't have to put it all in some stupid little box. It's just no, of course, I realized that I just rewrote a Billy Joel song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think he can copyright those <laughs> those four words or whatever that is. Five words, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dave. Billy really will forgive me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Uh, he's forgiven me worth. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah. Because really. talking with people who grew up in the same ground you did should be fun. Yeah. I find that every time I leave the U.S. and I meet another American, I have this weird experience of like, oh, somebody with familiar background. We can talk about something for about a minute here and have some common ground. It's the strangest thing. Uh, I never I'd feel that careful, way going uh, over here. I'm careful north of Lansing. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't, you don't want to think that and run into to uh, what they call themselves, so the Michigan militia or whatever they call themselves. So, you know. <laughs> I know what you mean. Things, things are dangerous everywhere. Everywhere. But, you know, it's fun to try. Definitely. And maybe that's what our conversation was about. Or maybe it's about, well, what's the worst that could happen? 
anyway, that was fun. It really was. Take care, Dave. I'll see you again. Hey, if you're down this way, come and say hello. Will do. No, we got a good we got a good uh, wine library. I'd love to come come back to Fairfield County. Well, again maybe <laughs> that Frank Joyce has a better one, but you shouldn't tell everybody I mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> the library. <laughs> good. All right. You take care. You too, Dave. Bye. And thanks, everybody, for tuning into this uh, interview with Dave Marsh. And uh, check out landofhopeanddreams.co, where there will be uh, all sorts of events happening every weekend, throughout the weekend, this weekend and for the next three weekends, uh, talking about uh, basically uh, Dave and um, how he's influenced many different people in many different ways. And uh, you can also read articles he wrote in the Fifth Estate in 1969 if you go to fifthestate.org and look him up there. And also you can subscribe to the Fifth Estate there and you'll get uh, Peter Werby's debut novel, Summer on Fire, about Detroit 1967, where Dave also plays a, a role as a character in there. And uh, although, you know, he might. It's, it's not autobiographical entirely, but he, he might make appearances in there. All right, um, and uh, I'll be back uh, tomorrow at around the same time to talk to, uh, now who am I talking to tomorrow? I don't know, I'll tell you tomorrow. But uh, And um, until then, remember, mutual aid will get us through. Don't pay the rent unless you really have to. And uh, bye for now. <laughs>